Good afternoon, nursing students. Today we'll be reviewing chapter 15 in Gradner, which is diabetes. Gradner reviews in depth type 1 and type 2 diabetes, and most nursing students are exposed to some of the different types of diabetes. Note that Gradner does not review metabolic syndrome, also known as syndrome X, but nutrition ATI does. So make sure you know the symptoms, including android obesity, um, dyslipidemia, so high cholesterol, high triglycerides, insulin resistance. Diabetes characteristics are twofold. Either there's a complete lack of insulin secretion by the beta cells of Langerhan in the pancreas, which is more characteristic of type 1 diabetes, or there's insulin resistance and defects of insulin receptors as we commonly see in type 2 diabetes. While the focus is on aberrations of metabolism in carbohydrate, we also see patients with diabetes having protein and lipid metabolism um, errors because of hyperglycemia. In general, diabetes is a chronic medical condition. It's lifelong disorder, which is an understatement, um, especially in caring for a child with type 1 diabetes, which most of my nursing students know I've been doing for 10 years. It's constant monitoring. It's a 24-7 job, um, especially in a child, because it's difficult to maintain homo glucose homeostasis um, due to the child's diet, activity levels, and emotional status. The main goal of treatment is achievement of insulin to glucose rate homeostasis. And the technology has really flourished. Some patients are still on MDI therapy. However, with the new insulin pumps, we are able to program ICR, which is insulin carb ratio, and basal rates of fast-acting glucose that goes into the subcutaneous catheter of the insulin pump to maintain that glucose homeostasis. In Grodner um, page, or rather it's table 15.2, know this table for diagnosing diabetes. We look at A1C or hemoglobin A1C to determine the long-term glucose stability or homeostasis. For type 1 diabetes, the A1C is measured every three months. And for type 2, it's measured every three months upon diagnosis until the A1C goal is 7.0 or less. And then we monitor every six months. So this is based on the new standards of care for diabetes by the ADA, and those were revised in 2017. If you're interested in looking at those standards of care further, I have the link as you can see on your slide. While the onset of type 1 diabetes is sudden, it can go unnoticed over time. We've had kids enter the ER with a BG of over 1,000 milligrams per deciliter and are incoherent, um, not alert, and going into a coma. So they do, at that point, go into DKA, which we'll discuss further. So looking at type 1 diabetes, what typically happens is it is an autoimmune illness. And what happens is there's autoantibodies, which means the body makes antibodies against itself. And it leads to the beta cell destruction in the pancreas, leading to um, insulin deficiency. So the pancreas does not 
secrete any insulin. We'll see symptoms of polyphagia, glucosuria, polydipsia, polyuria, and weight loss. There are vicious cycles of this increased consumption of food um, because the body thinks it's starving, which in turn creates an excess amount of glucose being secreted in the urine, um, glucosuria, which in turn causes increased thirst, which is polydipsia, and the frequent need to urinate, which is polyuria. So despite that increased consumption of food, those with type one prior to diagnosis typically lose weight. And as I mentioned, my younger daughter, Michaela, has had type one diabetes for 10 years and we'll have an opportunity to have her come in and lecture and talk about her story. Um, but there are many theories, okay, why they're not really sure. So there are theories of why type one develops. The first is genetics. So if someone, typically the mom or dad has type one diabetes, you could then, um, through the genes, pass that on to one of your offspring. The other is the autoimmune illness um, with one or more autoantibodies are present. And um, the other is prior exposure to a virus that destroys the beta cells. So those are the three diagnoses. There's also some terms following diagnosis called the honeymoon phase. And in the honeymoon phase with patients with type 1 diabetes, the think of the pancreas is still kind of spitting out some insulin. So those patients require little or no insulin to correct for food or um, to correct for elevated blood glucose levels. Typically, this will last six months to a year. Um, other issues are dawn phenomenon. Dawn phenomenon tends to occur um, early in the morning, um, type 1 patients are typically insulin resistant with dawn phenomenon. Sometimes it occurs later on at night, um, specifically with my daughter when she was in grade school. She would be insulin resistant at 930 when she had her 930 snack. She was always running in the 200s. The other term is Samaji effect. And that is a morning rebound hyperglycemia after a low at night. So what typically happens is you'll correct the low with a fast acting glucose. Um, and in the morning, there's rebound hyperglycemia or high blood glucose level. With type 2 diabetes, there is even more of a gradual onset of polyuria and polydipsia. Patients complain that they're frequently fatigued and um, some have frequent UTIs. Now this can go over years, um, five, 10 years before we see an elevation in the fasting blood glucose. And again, the causes for type 2 is insulin resistance. Um, typically, it's obesity because there's too many cells for the insulin to get to, and the patient becomes um, insulin resistant, um, or the cells are not able to respond to the insulin. So the difference is type 2, they're still, the pancreas is still secreting insulin, the, the cells just aren't able to absorb it because there's too many secondary to obesity. Two risk factors for type two diabetes include family history and obesity. We typically look at the upper body obesity it's called in the abdomen, it's called android obesity. Um, so these patients look like they have um, a big abdomen, 
It's an apple shaped called andro obesity. And typically the, when we measure the waist to hip ratios, they're greater than 0 0.8 in women. Um, and in men, they are a range of 0 0.9 to 1.0. That puts them at an increased risk of morbid obesity and an increased risk of type 2 diabetes. All patients with type 1 diabetes will require exogenous insulin. There's two ways that we can do it regarding either subcutaneous injections, so those are the MDIs, or an insulin pump. If it's via syringe, usually a fast-acting insulin is given during the day to cover um, meals, snacks, and corrections for high blood glucose. Then a long-acting insulin, like Lantus, is given at night over a 24-hour period, so it lasts 24 hours. And that's the way, um, one of the ways that we can monitor and treat type 1 diabetes. The other way is through an insulin pump, and the insulin is infused via a subcutaneous catheter. The insulin is rapid acting. Um, we program in ICRs, which are insulin carb ratios, to cover for food and beverage intake. And then we also program in basal rates, so it's a minute amount of insulin that's infused every hour, and you can make changes to that, but that it goes into the um, subcutaneous catheter for a 24-hour period. Patients with type 2 diabetes, most um, will require diet and exercise changes, and they're put on an oral hypoglycemic agent. Some that become insulin resistant and do not respond to the oral hypoglycemic agents then are put on insulin to optimize glucose control. We're going to review the different types of insulin, and um, this is in Grodner, your textbook. I want to just mention that um, on the slide, there is a picture of the Medtronic insulin pump. So if you look back throughout the years, they've become a lot smaller. It almost looks like a pager. Whereas when they first started, it almost looks like a big block, like a brick, like a, the older cell phones. And what's in um, the caregiver's hand is the subcutaneous injection catheter. So that is placed into the patient's skin, and we'll review a little bit how that works. So conventional or standard insulin therapy is a combination of intermediate acting with uh, rapid acting insulin, or it's a mixture dose. Flexible or intensive is the MDI of rapid acting prior to meals, as well as um, add in either immediate acting every day or twice a day. And then the insulin pump is also known as the continuous subcutaneous insulin infusion. And that's what Michaela, my daughter, uses for her insulin therapy. It's rapid acting insulin. It's infused via a pump continuously. As I mentioned, the basal rates are in micro amounts. And then we bolus in rapid acting to cover meals prior to meals, after we carb count um, and correct for hyperglycemia. This chart gives you the types of insulin that are available in the United States 
and it depends on your facility what formularies are used. But just to review, um, the rapid acting is at the top, and most in the United States, you'll see we'll use Hemolog or Novolog. Um, those are the ones that go into the insulin pump. Your regular and MPH insulin, those are the ones that President Trump approved to um, pay $25 a vial. Um, and you can get those at the Walmart pharmacy. Unfortunately, you can't use regular or inter intermediate in the pump, and um, they don't work as well as the fact at acting and the long acting. The long acting, um, as I mentioned, it's given in the evening, and um, I'm familiar with Lantus. That's what we used. You may use Levamir in your facility. And then the mixtures, I don't see too much. Those are typically like the older doctors will prescribe those, um, like a 70-30. Um, but we don't typically see those too much. And again, they're not going to be as effective as some of the newer rapid acting and long acting. And this chart is in your Okay. On the next slide, it's important for us to know the appropriate sites for self-injection of insulin. Um, and this figure is in your book, 15.6. It's a good graphic of what the viable sites are for either injections or subcutaneous catheter insertions via the insulin pump. So as you can see, um, the appropriate sites would be left abdomen, right abdomen. Typically, you'll do two inches from the umbilicus. And you can tell two inches. Um, this is a little trick for you. <laughs> so this, you take your thumb, and from the knuckle to the end of the nail, and it has to be a shorter nail, um, this is one inch. So this is kind of how you measure um, two inches. So left, right, left and right abdomen, um, left and right buttocks, left and right thigh, um, and then also you can do it into the triceps area. Make sure that is it's in the middle. So you measure from the shoulder bone um, to the elbow, and it should be right in the middle. And you're always going to be looking for um, adipose tissue, fat. You don't want that. It's not an IM injection. Okay. Also, it's important to discuss that we need to rotate the sites. So, for example, if you're doing MDI in your facility, you would start with the left abdomen, next time right abdomen, and then left buttocks, right buttocks. Then you could do left and then right um, triceps, and then left and right thighs. For the insulin pump, Typically, the infusion set is changed every 48 to 72 hours based on the FDA recommendations. If you do not do that, you run the risk of infection. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And then we also have a newer, um, a newer um, continuous glucose monitor, which is another injection site and it measures the blood glucose levels in the interstitial versus the plasma. And so plasma is when you do the finger prick on your patients via glucometer. Um, it used to be that the variation was pretty great. So the continuous glucose monitors weren't great in monitoring, um, but the company Dexcom is the company that makes the CGMs. And ever since they approved it in PEDS, I think it was March of 2015, um, they have had um, advancements in technologies. So 
you some of the patients will just use the CGM now instead of doing the fingerprint pricks and there's no calibration. So like I said, the technology has really come a long way, which is really exciting. Okay, so let's talk about oral hypoglycemic agents for patients with type 2. Um, typically are prescribed when diet and physical exercise are not able to control the hyperglycemia. Um, it's all about compliance. And if you have a patient that is motivated, whatever they're motivated, motivated by, a lot of my patients and outpatient that are diagnosed, diagnosed with type 2, um, pain is a fear, and so is um, death. <laughs> So there are um, several oral hypoglycemic agents that are on the market now, and they're exclusively used for type 2 diabetes. Some of these I tested when I worked in clinical research. I tested metformin, which is glucophage, and that's widely used right now. I think that's the drug of choice for type 2. Um, the benefits of metformin are not only to lower the blood glucose level, but patients can lose weight while taking this medication. Um, the other medications that I worked on were the sulfonylureas, which are the micronase and then the diabetes. Unfortunately, these types of drugs tend to poop out, meaning the patient's body becomes used to it and then they need to add another med to achieve the same effect. Um, so typically another drug has to be added at that point. So you can see that we do have some choices. Um, however, metformin, glucophage, you'll note your patients will be most likely prescribed. Monitoring blood glucose level is equally important as the mechanism of administering insulin. We can do it in a couple ways. One is on the screen, that is a beer glucometer. So that's used for self-monitoring. Um, patients with type 1 can check their blood sugar um, up to 8 to 10 times a day. For type 2s, we recommend it at least three times a day. We also recommend the um, A1C, and the patient has to go to a lab fasting every three months. And that shows us how compliant they are in the long term. And both um, type 1s and type 2s, we'd like to see the A1C seven or below. In the beginning, we also recommend for both types of diabetes to document their food intake, um, the timing of the insulin, and if they engage in any exercise, so we can evaluate the effectiveness of the nutrition therapy and make changes as we go along. As a review, we want to look at what the goals are for the blood glucose levels. Before meals, we'd like to see the BG level as a range between 70 and 130 milligrams per deciliter. Two hours postprandial should be less than 180 milligrams per deciliter. And that is based on um, the ADA standards of care and also the ATI book. However, um, just in personal experience, I like to see the two-hour postprandial at 140 milligrams per deciliter. If I see 180 two hours after, I'm going to be correcting with insulin. Bedtime, you do not want to go too low. We like to see it between 90 and 150 milligrams per deciliter. Okay, just a quick review of hypo and hyperglycemia 
and we'll re be reviewing more of the symptoms in lecture. Hypoglycemia typically we'll see a blood glucose level drop below 70 milligrams per deciliter. Um, and most of my patients will say that they experience um, diaphoresis, they're shaking, they're dizzy, they're fatigued, they're crabby, hungry, they have a headache, um, causes, sometimes we overcorrect with insulin, the patient may have skipped a meal, um, they exercise without having a snack, um, and it, typically the hypoglycemia will occur at night during sleep if they didn't have a snack before they went to bed or they went to bed with a blood glucose level that was too low. <clears throat> Patients that experience um, long-term hyperglycemia run the risk of going into diabetic ketoacidosis, which is DKA. And what happens is because the blood glucose level is uncontrolled, the patient will start to break down fatty acids, which the fatty acids accumulate ketone bodies in the blood. And again, the most of the time is the long-term hyperglycemia. Sometimes we'll see it in um, dehydration, um, if patient has rapid respirations, but you can always tell if you want to work in the ER, a patient comes in with fruity or acetone breath. Um, a lot of um, practitioners think that the patient is intoxicated. However, you have to get a BG level right away, and then that will determine that the patient is um, hyperglycemia, hyperglycemic and running the risk of going into DKA. So what usually happens is um, pre-diagnosis of diabetes. The patient doesn't know that he or she has diabetes. Um, they do not give insulin. Um, they consume too much food without correcting um, and sometimes patients, even without diabetes, if they um, experience um, trauma or surgery, then they could possibly go into DKA. Managing both type 1 and type 2 diabetes is multifaceted. The first item is blood glucose management via um, glucometer or CGM. What's also important is carbohydrate counting and the proper timing on dosage of insulin. So to give you an example, if a patient is on regular insulin, usually you want to administer the insulin 20 to 30 minutes prior to a meal because the onset of regular insulin is 30 minutes. Rapid acting insulin, five to 10 minutes prior to a meal. And if a patient is type two on an oral hypoglycemic agent, then they wanna take that medication prior to a meal. We also want to manage the blood glucose levels, but also looking at the lipoprotein levels um, for total cholesterol and LDL, and managing blood pressure levels. It's common among patients with diabetes for them to experience diabetic gastroparesis, typically occur occurs in 20 to 30% of patients. It's the result of delayed gastric emptying due to GERD, um, nausea, abdominal pain, vomiting, uh, early satiety, so they're getting full very quickly, um, and weight loss. 
Modifications of the diet assist in decreasing those symptoms. So the recommendation is to try soft foods of liquid consistency, like clear liquids, full liquids, soft diet. Consuming six meals a day is extremely helpful. Increasing fiber um, if the patient experiences diarrhea or constipation. Combating dry mouth with increasing fluids. Um, maybe you can add um, broth or some type of liquid to moisten foods. A low-fat diet has been shown to help with gastric symptoms and gastric emptying. Um, and I know this personally that my daughter eats very fast, the one who has diabetes, and so she experiences gastroparesis. She gets full very quickly. Sometimes she doesn't sit when she eats, so she's standing up. Um, and so we encourage that she eats slowly, do some behavior modification, um, and try to eat smaller meals. If we were on campus and uh, the goal is to get there, we have stations uh, monitoring the student's blood glucose levels, learning how to carb count, and then inserting, practice inserting infusion sets for insulin pumps. If you're interested in seeing how that um, works, you can go to these um, links the first one is the Silhouette Infusion Set by Medtronic. There's also the Mio Infusion Set. And then if you click on the last link, um, that's my YouTube video of inserting the, um, the first one, the Silhouette. Um, so if you're interested in looking at those, feel free. Um, knowledge is power. But we will review those in lecture. All right, you guys have a great day and we'll talk soon. Bye-bye now.